All right, so my name is Danielle Maynard. I'm an assistant professor of pathology and oncology here at Johns Hopkins and the director of the HBCU mentoring program. Thank you for joining today. Uh, you can follow us on LinkedIn to see upcoming workshops as well as any opportunities for undergrads that would include uh, jobs, summer internships, scholarships, etc. And all of our workshops are found on YouTube. We have a wonderful panel here today. I'm going to get started with a few quick notes and then I'll have the uh, panelists tell you about their individual programs. There'll be a Q&A session at the end so you can start putting your questions in the chat or you can write them down and wait until uh, the Q&A session when you can unmute and ask your questions. Um, and I will stick around a few minutes after the hour if you have more specific questions about your application or you have more specific questions for me. All right. So one of the most common questions I get is, how do I know I'm ready to apply for a PhD or for medical school? Um, and I will say for those interested in a PhD, I'm gonna direct you to one of our former workshops, the All About PhDs series, uh, specifically the How to Apply workshop, which goes through all the components of the application, what admission committees are looking for. And you can kind of think about where you stand and which of those things you might need to improve on. For those interested in MDs, uh, the MSC website actually has a list of institutions with all of their required uh, courses and average GPAs and MCAT scores and things like that. So that could be a guide to see where you stand. Um, but certainly any program that you're interested in, if you go to the website, most times they're going to outline what the expectations are, what the average GPA is, uh, what kind of coursework they want you to have, uh, any other kinds of requirements. And so you can typically look at that and gauge where you are compared to what the average applicant looks like. Uh, but importantly, you want to use your mentors. You can go directly to your mentor and say, hey, I'm thinking about applying for this thing. Here's my CV, here's where I stand. Do you think it's a good time for me to apply or maybe do I need to wait? All right, so I'm gonna jump into some of the things you can do sort of more traditional routes after you've finished your undergrad, but you're not quite ready to apply to your PhD or MD or whatever other program. These are not uh, exclusive. There, there are many things you can do, but these are sort of the, the more standard paths. So the first of course is get a job. That's kind of the most common thing you can do after you get a college degree. The advantage there, of course, is you get paid as opposed to you paying tuition, uh, which is nice. And typically there's no commitment uh, to, to a specific path that you're definitely gonna go to a PhD or MD. And so you have some freedom and flexibility to sort of explore and think about what you might wanna do. Um, but a major advantage really is you get to immerse yourself in your field of interest. So if you're really interested in HIV research, it's probably a good idea to apply to labs uh, for tech, lab tech or lab um, technologist type positions in a lab or area that does HIV research. If you're interested in more clinical work, they're clinical, uh, uh, more like clinical um, coordinator type roles where you get direct interaction with um, patients and so forth. So you can really immerse yourself in the environment and see, is this something I really want to do? And of course, build your network of people in that field who can help guide you and become mentors and so forth. The downside is there's no guaranteed mentorship. Your boss is not obligated to mentor you through the process of applying to whatever you're applying next. Although most times, especially in academia, people are willing, I know anybody who comes to my lab, I'm happy to help them with any kinds of applications they might have. Um, and there's no specific curriculum. So it's not usually designed to necessarily help you to get one place to the next. It's, it's really just a job. But you can start to seek out all the different things that might be useful for you. I think this route is a really good path for somebody who's sort of still deciding. You're not quite sure what you want to do yet. And this gives you a little bit of flexibility to explore on your own time. Also for those people who have decided, so you know for sure you're going to medical school, you already have all the courses you need, but you're just taking some time to get through the application or prepare for the MCAT. You know, if you have a job as opposed to some other design program that's gonna specify what you should be doing, that sometimes could be, um, a, you know, a, a better fit. I would say when you're applying for these positions, be transparent with whomever is hiring you of what you're planning to do. Oftentimes they might know about resources and ways that can help you towards wherever you're going, but if they don't know, they can't help. And in this field, you can actually seek out positions. You don't have to just rely on what's listed as job openings. If there's a lab you're very interested in or a company you think is really interesting, you can actually reach out and say, hey, I'm really interested. Here's my CV. Are there any positions open? 
The next option, of course, is a master's program. And this often is a little bit more focused on coursework. So for somebody who's maybe changing focus, maybe you were a psychology major and you figured out in your senior year you want to do a PhD in neuroscience and you're missing some of the advanced biology courses, some of the physical science courses. Oftentimes a master's program or master's degree is a good way to go in there and get those courses. So one, you're prepared because you've been exposed to the content, but also you can show you at the admissions committee, hey, I can handle graduate level courses and I can do well. Um, so this is, you know, also if you need to improve your grades, maybe you have done the courses, but you didn't get the best grades. So doing an advanced course could be helpful. And oftentimes, not always, but there will be some sort of dedicated research component, um, a thesis or uh, research for credit or something of that sort. Of course, master's programs can be very costly. Uh, you could put yourself in a lot of debt trying to go after certain master's programs. So you want to be careful which ones you select. Um, and of course, this would also mean that you've kind of decided with the, which direction you're going to go because a master's is going to be sort of a predetermined curriculum in one area. Uh, and oftentimes will not include more practical experience like clinical shadowing or, um, or what have you. Uh, so this is a good fit for people who have a particular focus on improving their co coursework, whether in, in content or in grades. Um, also for international applicants or even persons who are at smaller institutions here at, at, in the U.S. where even though you have really good grades, maybe your coursework might not, we, we're not able to really judge you against some of the other institutions. And so having a, a master's from like an one institution, for instance, could be helpful. I would say to seek out either programs that don't require tuition or that will have some lower tuition, maybe because you're a TA or you're doing research or something that's going to offset the cost. You don't want to put yourself in debt. Uh, chances that this alone is not going to get you into the next thing. There might be other ways you can achieve whatever you're trying to in order to get to the next step. So you want to be careful not to put yourself in debt doing so. And know the details of the program. Does the program actually have uh, designed research for you to do, or is that something you have to do on the side and it's not really catering for it? So you now have to find time outside of studying and all the credits they expect you to do to find research. Uh, and finally, there are post back programs. And these, of course, are designed specifically to help you transition from undergrad into these uh, graduate programs. Many of them will provide a stipend. Um, well, typically, it's more the um, MD track ones that will not provide a stipend or might have a cost. Um, oftentimes, you can get help with MCAT preparation, both the actual courses or, or um, funding for the preparation and for taking the exam. And of course, application preparation and so forth. Usually there's some mentored research experience involved, which is of course a big pull uh, and professional development and all the other things that help you prepare not only to get into grad or med school, but to thrive once you get there. Uh, typically, post back programs are gonna be sort of designed towards a specific path, maybe either PhD or MD, although a few might consider both. And so it's a good idea to um, kind of know what you wanna do as opposed to, I'm not really sure, but I'll take this one that's supposed to train me towards PhD, but really you wanna go to med school, it's not really gonna help you get there. So you wanna find one that's uh, specific to you. Um, and sometimes these post back programs might not provide any advantage in terms of coursework because either uh, there, there's no coursework in, involved or you have sort of packed curriculum that doesn't give you enough time to take the courses you might need. And typically there's some eligible, eligibility uh, requirements that you want to look out for. So I would say for a person who has decided which track they want to go mostly, and they have most of the requirements, but they just need that extra. So maybe you have all your coursework, but you only had a little bit of research experience because your institution didn't have lots of research options. And this is a really good track for you. And particularly if you require that mentorship um, and guidance, you want to have somebody who can help you through the process, then this is also a good um, option. But you want to find the right fit, make sure you look at what the program is really offering. Is that the right one for you? And you have to apply to multiple programs. Most of these programs really take, only take a few people. And so you have to apply to multiple to increase your chances. This QR code uh, is a link to all of the NIH sponsored prep programs. And it's a long list. So I would advise you look at the institutions that you think you're interested in going to for grad school or med school. And those are good ones to apply to. All right, so the actual application. I have two QR codes here because in two previous workshops, I've gone through these in a lot more detail and I wouldn't have time to do that here and still have you listen to the programs coming up. So I'd encourage you to go back to those um, uh, workshops. They're all on YouTube. If you just go to the YouTube channel, you can search through and find them and they go through in detail, you know, 
you know, what your CBR resume should look like, how to write a personal versus research statement and so forth and so on. But I'll briefly say for your transcript, make sure you re review your transcript before you send it anywhere. Sometimes there are mistakes on there and they could be detrimental. Uh, your CBR resume should not be more than one to two pages. If it's longer than that, you're probably either putting things that are not relevant or it's not put in a, a, a concise way. And the thing I would always say is to consider that most times people are going to be reviewing 20, 30, 40 applications. They do not have time to sift through a three, four, five page resume to find the pertinent thing. So you want to make it very easy for them to spot what they're looking for. Um, and I talk about that in a few of the uh, workshops. And your personal statement should give some color or context to who you are. So it should not just be a reiteration of your CV or just like you put in your CV in paragraph form. I should now be able to get some context of who you are and sort of understand where you're applying for whatever you're applying for um, and feel like I get to know you a little bit in, in your uh, personal statement. So I'll move on from here. Just a few things to think about. This is a fantastic time for exploration, right? Some of you, since you were in primary school or, or elementary school, you probably said, hey, I want to be a vet or I want to go to medical school. And you get to undergrad and you start doing courses and you start finding that that motivation is slipping away or other things are catching your interest. And that is okay. In fact, that is the whole point of college, I think, right? So you want to follow that and really take the time to explore what options you have and not necessarily continue on a path because that's one the, the original one that you set. As you get more information, it's okay to readjust and give yourself grace to find the thing that is right for you. Um, there are many, many degrees and many careers that are not MD or PhD. And this is just one short list of degrees, particularly in sort of the medical field that are not MD or not PhD will give you fantastic careers. And it is good to know what the options are and explore them now so that you don't necessarily commit to a particular path. if That's not the thing that might be right for you. And uh, later this year, we'll have another version of our STEM careers beyond MD and PhD workshop. We had one uh, two before that featured a few other um, uh, careers. And we also look at careers that don't require doctoral degrees. There's some with your bachelor's alone, you get in there, you do certificates, you get training on the, the job, you become expert, and you can build very, very good careers. And it's a good idea to explore all the options and see what's the best fit for you. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little very briefly about some of the programs here at Hopkins, and then I'll hand over to some of our uh, panelists. So the first is the NIH uh, sponsored program or funded program here at Hopkins Prep, um, and this one is targeted towards people who are interested in. So you must be interested in a PhD um, if you're if you want to do MD and PhD then sometimes they'll accept one or two students, but really this is focused on PhD uh, pursuing students. Uh, usually you have to be a permanent resident. Your GPA should be above 3.3, but if it's less, and especially if you have some research experience, there is still a chance. So you still wanna put your application in. Um, they usually accept about four to six students per year. A stipend is included, insurance is included, and typically you get matched with a research mentor. You're going to interview with multiple labs based on your interest, and then you pick one and you spend the next year or two doing research in a very guided way. Um, usually you have like a committee who helps you through the process. You learn how to present your research, um, how to write about your research and so forth, and uh, attend meetings and so forth. There are a bunch of workshops, professional development, and absolutely help with your application preparation as well as mock interviews. And the deadline for this one is the 15th. There's a QR code, hopefully you've already scanned that so you can go directly to the page um, and the application site. The second program is the doctoral diversity program. So this program now, um, they don't care if you wanna do MD or PhD, but you do need to be doing something in a health related field or biomedical research. Um, and specifically, this is targeted towards students who are low income or educationally under-resourced, and they have very specific metrics as to what that is. So you can go to the website and see whether or not you will qualify. They accept a few more students, so about five to nine per year, and the stipend uh, for most of the programs are about the same, it's 36,000, and that includes um, your insurances. Uh, the structure is very similar. In this case, I think you do a short rotation. So you spend a few days to a week in a couple of different labs. You pick one, then you have that dedicated research and all of the workshops and mentoring and so forth. Um, they offer MCAT prep, of course, for students who are uh, interested in medical school. 
And the final program is actually the newest post-bac program, at least that I'm aware of at Hopkins, the Schaffel program. And uh, this one now, again, you can be either MD or PhD pursuing or any other uh, biomedical field related career. Um, but they have a special uh, interest in prostate cancer. So typically you would end up in a lab doing prostate cancer research and there's also a strong interest in health disparities and health equity. So if that's an interest for you, this is a good program to consider. They accept fewer students, maybe one or two per year. Um, permanent residence is not required, but it is preferred. And uh, the average GPA is, a, is about above 3.5. But again, if you have a GPA that's a little bit below, and especially if there's a good reason for it, then you can show progression over time that you've been improving your GPA, you have some, you have a really strong interest in the field, I would still encourage you to apply. Um, again, similar, you get matched with a research mentor, you do research for a few years, but they also have a number of community-based initiatives that you participate in, uh, will help with MPAT prep, and they do have clinical shadowing and a number of uh, peer mentorship uh, opportunities. And actually, we have a current trainee who's going to tell you a little bit about her experience, um, and it will stick around to answer questions from some of you. So I'm going to hand over now to Kennedy. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kennedy Rains. I am a current Schaffel student, and I am also a post -bac trainee in Dr. Maynard's lab. Oh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so a little bit about who I am. Um, I graduated from Norfolk State University in 2022 in May. I was a biology major with a chemistry minor. So once I was about to graduate, I had to decide what I wanted to do next, and I chose to do a post -bac program. Um, for one, I wanted a kind of a break from school, so I didn't want to go straight into a master's, um, and I didn't want to go straight into medical school either. I wanted to get a little bit of research experience under my belt, with also without going into debt. So I chose a number of post back programs to apply to, and then to make my decision, I asked myself three things. Well, focus on these four things, basically. One was to keep track of I wanted a program that was going to keep me on track for my career goals. I wanted to be in medical school, so I wanted to choose a program that would help me get into medical school. I also wanted a way to build more connections, and I also wanted to create a project that was aimed at tackling health disparities. I chose the Schaffelt program because my grandfather was recently diagnosed with prostate cancer, so I was able to create a project that also further looked into his disease. And then lastly, I also wanted to continue doing community service projects that were focused on helping the Black community. Um, so these are a couple of pictures of me and my cohort. Um, we have Brenda and Lai in these pictures. So in this program, we're allowed to do clinical shadowing in the OR and in the clinic. And then we also can go to different trainings that are allowed at Johns Hopkins for the medical students. So on the right, we're at the Da Vinci machine, which is a machine used um, for surgeries. We got to train on those and also do any of the minim minimally invasive trainings that are used for the medical students that they have to pass in order to go into their surgery rotation. Um, this is a picture from one of our community site um, activities. So we do community service every month. Every Wednesday, we go to a place called The Market in Baltimore, where we talk to people about prostate cancer, raise, raise awareness, and we're also starting to raise awareness about um, colorectal cancer as well. It's a very great opportunity. We get to meet so many different people, hear their stories, help them, help and guide them into getting themselves checked, their family members checked, and anybody that they feel like may need to go to see the doctor. So on the research side of the um, of this program, I am in Dr. Maynard's lab. Um, so the main thing you wanna do with research is you want to kind of learn new things and also get your research out there. So you'll be able to go to places like a conference. So this past October, me and Dr. Maynard went to Kenya to present the research that we both have done so far. And it was an amazing opportunity. We were surrounded by so many other like-minded scientists that wanted to do collaborations and um, also just learn more about the story that we want to tell with our research. So in order to make the most of your experience, I wanna say you most you first wanna take advantage of the network at your institution. So at Johns Hopkins, there are a lot of connections that you can make and you wanna make sure that your name is out there and that you're meeting the people that you had the opportunity to meet so that they can help you on your journey because they want to help you. You're a student, they wanna push you forward, they wanna see you succeed. Um, Next, you wanna also make your questioning things that you are not sure about, and you wanna suggest ideas and alternatives that you feel like will be a best fit for you. Because at the end of the day, this is your work, your name will be on it. So you wanna make sure that your name is connected to something that you understand and that you want to put forward in the world. Um, if there's something in the program you wanna contribute and make suggestions about, I also recommend doing that. 
because a program is geared to helping you. You want to use this program to the best of its abilities. So don't be scared to make sure that you're, it's helping you in the areas that, and that you need. For instance, my program, they provide an MCAT prep um, course through Kaplan. A lot of um, my cohort, we felt that the Kaplan was not as good as we wanted it to be. So we also should suggest that they buy us a UWorld account. And they did that. And now we're using that to study for our MCAT. Um, last, next, you want to make sure you stick to your plan and your goals. It's kind of easy to get sidetracked when you're doing research because you are doing it so long. You're really invested in it. You want to see everything continue through and get completed and you want answers. So it's hard to kind of sometimes let go and make sure you're still focusing on the other side of why you're in this program, which is to get to where you want to get to. And then lastly, you want to make sure that you're finding opportunities that will maximize and expand your capabilities. You want to be diligent in making sure that the work you're doing will provide further opportunities to advance your experience while you're at that institution. Um, like that means collaborations, conferences, journal clubs, anything that you can join to help you in your journey. Thank you. Um, and now we're going to move on to Towson University. Um, hey, I'm Alana Ehrlich, and I'm one of the co-directors of the Towson University Bridges to the Doctorate Program. So this is unique. Um, so I was listening to the intro, and you know, there's this is the pros of uh, masters, and this is the pros of a prep program, a post back program. And so we kind of have the merge, and um, I'm going to tell you who this is perfect for. Um, if you have a 3.8 you know, GPA and you know you want to go get your PhD, do that prep program, get that research experience, and go. If you have like a 3.3 or a 3.0 and you have no research experience and you're not really sure what you want and you need a little extra time figuring it out, Bridges to the Doctorate is fantastic because at the end you get your master's. So um, it's good for those who would like to press a little bit of a reset button on that GPA, because we've all had bad moments, um, that organic chemistry class that gave you a C. And who has that? I have that. Um, <laughs> I see a hand up. And um, so this is a nice reset. And I can say it's really, it works out really well for our students. Um, so we're at Towson University. We're just north of Baltimore. And the Bridges program is a partnership with University of Maryland School of Medicine and Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And this is a fantastic program because you actually get um, three different research experiences. You come to us after your bachelor's degree, you start a master's, you do 30 credits of master's level coursework. Your first um, summer, right after you get into the program, we send you away. We send you downtown. We send you to Hopkins. And you actually um, merge right with that prep program and uh, do a small summer internship. And that's uh, Kathy Wilson's, uh, the one that she directs. And so she is fantastic. We love her. So like another shout out for that prep program. And um, so you go there, you spend the summer working in a lab at Hopkins, and then you come back to us um, just, you know, 20 minutes north and uh, do you start your master's program. And it's a thesis-based master's. So you join a lab, you're doing research full-time. Um, we give you tuition waiver so you don't go into debt. We pay your fees. And um, actually in the summer, if you want, we'll even pay for you to live on campus at Hopkins so that, that you can be a part of that cohort doing the summer internships down there. And um, so then you do your master's level research, you're doing your, your, um, your, your classes, and then your second summer rolls around. And then we send you away again, and we send you to University of Maryland School of Medicine, and you do a summer internship there. And that's, they kind of like fold you into their summer. They have a lot of summer internships there. And so you're part of a larger group of, there's a lot of professional development, kind of the, the same thing that happens at Hopkins. So you not only are getting the Towson research, but you're getting the Hopkins research and you're getting the Maryland research. So I think it's really um, great for those who are really not sure what they want and want to explore different areas. Um, so 
We also um, have you take some PhD level coursework. And so you do that through University of Maryland. Uh, often we have students take um, a genomics and bioinformatics class, but we've had students take immunology. And last year, um, this one student who is in this picture here, she's the uh, third from the right, she took the um, she took the immunology course in the PhD program at Maryland. She got the highest grade in the class. <laughs> she blew all those PhD students out of the water. And so she's at Emory now in PhD program. Um, but um, it's great because then when you're applying to PhD programs, you say, hey, look, I have all this research experience. I could talk about my research. And um, you get letters of recommendation from all these different people who you've worked with, should you make a good impression, obviously. <laughs> and you can also talk about how you've done PhD level coursework. Um, and so that's also looks really nice. Um, so like I said, we pay your tuition, we pay your fees, you have a $27,000 um, a year stipend. Um, and that is for two years. So it's a two year master's program. So we're called the Bridges to the Doctorate Program at Towson University. I'm putting in the chat my email because, of course, I left that off. Um, I was looking at the last PowerPoint and I said, oh, email would be good. So here, just pull that from the chat. You can also just search Towson University Bridges to Doc. What else can I say? Um, it's a cohort-based program. We take four per year. Um, we provide support for travel to conferences every year. We send all the students to Abercams, and we also send students to a discipline-specific conference. Um, we It's just a great cohort um, and community. Uh, so where do our students go? So this group, I can tell you where everyone is right now. So starting on the left, um, we have Deja, uh, who's at um, USU, Uniform Services University. Um, Cheyenne is at Hopkins, School of Public Health. Um, Maria is at Harvard, Virology. Zagela is at the University of Virginia. Um, Tara is at Emory, and Dante is at University of Louisville. And so uh, the past two years, 100% of our students have been have had multiple interviews and been accepted to multiple programs, including two MD PhD programs. So for those of you who are MD PhD bound, we support that. MD only, that's a harder sell. The NIH gives us a hard time over that. It's a real bummer because physician scientists are really important. Um, but MD PhD, we're down with that. Uh, but please, um, feel free to shoot me an email if you want to talk. Oh, when is our application due? Our priority application was January 10th, so that is done. But <laughs> we have not started reviewing applications yet. Right now, we're still getting ourselves organized, and we do take applications through March 25th. Now, the risk of waiting till March 25th is all the spots might be gone. Um, but I would say for those of you who are interested in applying this year, send that application in and we will try to include you because we probably won't review for another week or two because we're tracking down missing letters of recommendation and that kind of stuff right now. That's it. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to hear from Case Western. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Pierre Hurd. I'm the Director of Enrollment Management for Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Um, and so I was invited to specifically be able to talk about a scholarship that was just rolled out within the last three years at Case Western Reserve University. And so we have just partnered with HBCUs all over the country, still adding more to the list um, with the North Star Award. And so the North Star Award is a scholarship that we're offering to students who are graduating from the universities that we are partnered with with the tuition break to be able to come into our master's, post -boc, and also our um, med program. So MD, PhD, PA, and then also our university MD program as well. So there's a couple of different things um, that matter as you go through. So there are some requirements as far as um, GPA or merit-based requirements to determine what percentage of the tuition breaker you will fall under. Um, and so right now, currently we're partnered with 10 schools 
Um, some of them are newly scholarships um, that have been added this year. So if you haven't heard about it at your university yet, that may be why you may have just been added to the list. Um, and then, as I said before, we're constantly adding schools or looking for more partnerships to add. And so some of the North Star benefits include having a um, application fee waived. So you don't pay any application fees to apply to the programs that are participating in the North Star Award. And then you also would be able to receive that tuition break. And a part of the requirement with coming and joining the program as well is to kind of go with them some guidelines for communities. So you are you do have a leader on campus or representative from our DEI space. You do have meetings where you have to meet with other scholars across all of our schools. The School of Medicine participates, but so does our other five schools a part of campus. Um, so law, arts and sciences, uh, Mandel, which is our social work school, but and other campuses that participate as well. So you do have a form of community or a format of community um, to be able to meet with other students and kind of do some team bonding. So you guys can kind of get to know each other and have your own form of culture or community across campus. Those requirements also include moving to Cleveland or moving on campus a little bit earlier than the semester starts so that you can get familiar with the other North Star scholars and be able to do some of that community bonding before you're able to start classes. Um, I am around through this call and also at the end of the call. So if anyone has any questions about the North Star, I will be able to answer those. I also have a link that I will be putting in the chat for you to be able to fill out the form, see if you have any questions, if you qualify for the North Star Award, um, to be able to join us or have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and we can see where you fall um, on the meter as far as qualifying. And like I said, that works for our master's degrees, our postdoc programs. Um, we do have a PrEP program, but PrEP, you would not need the North Star Award since it is covered by the NIH. You don't really have to worry about a tuition break or an application fee waiver, any of the things that the North Star Award would be beneficial for. Um, and so if you're looking into a postdoc or a master's program, and you're seeing your university on the screen, then the North Star Award is definitely something that you want to look into whether that is for a master's or a post box so you can be able to get that tuition break. Thank you. Hi, okay. This went really fast. I was thinking it was going to take a little bit longer to get to me. <laughs> My name is um, Oluwatonya Shujo, and I am Associate Director for Strategic Initiatives at Dartmouth College. And like Dr. Maven said, there are a lot of opportunities you can take advantage of um, while you are considering um, your gap year or post back. And Dartmouth College has all of them available for you. Um, we have programs where you can work as clinical research coordinators, which are actual jobs. But we also have a pilot program that we're running. I'm running it through my office with... Um, um, with Mr. Sean Hobson, who is the Director for Clinical Research. And that program will actually, you get paid to work as a clinical research coordinator while you get some um, coursework and access to career development to make you more competitive for whatever future careers you're looking at, like whether it's MD, straight up MD, or PhD or master's or to stay in the clinical research pathway. So if you're interested in those kind of positions, please reach out to either Sean or myself. Our emails are up there. Now, Dartmouth has a lot of job. Oh, previous slide, please. Um, Dartmouth has a lot of job opportunities. There's a host of technician jobs. Um, the jobs working um, in our what you call those core facilities. And there's a QR code for that. So just go to our HR. And if you, once you apply, um, let me know if you need any guidance. And another thing that is really cool about Dartmouth is the small size or numbers of our students. That allows um, for very, very welcoming faculty. So it's not unusual to just cold email a faculty and if they have grant funding, they can just say, come along, you can work as a technician with me. So 
Um, if you're interested in those, just go to the website. QR code is up there. Now, finally, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the prep program that we have at Dartmouth. Our prep program, unlike the ones that were mentioned before, is currently funded through philanthropy, which means that we are not holding you exclusively to be um, a PhD track person, but we'll prefer that you will be interested in pursuing further education afterwards. But just but that's the QR code that will help you apply for that. And whatever you do, if you're interested in coming over to Dartmouth, just email me. My email was on the previous slide. Check out our programs. And we have a lot more programs that I mentioned, a lot of which are funded through philanthropy at the Cancer Center. So let me know. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our um, panelists. And I'm going to stop the recording now and we can start Q&A session.